excited to share this word of God with you. You might need a pen or some paper or your phone to take some notes in because we're going to dig down into the word of God and we're not coming out till we get a real good understanding. I want to talk to you, and the title alone is challenging, about broadening your circle. Now, to all of you who don't want to uh, have a circle or you're introverted, you think you don't need a circle, let me tell you something. For what God wants to do in your life, you're going to have to let some people in. And when I get through teaching, you're going to understand it has to be more than the hand-picked specialized group that you've set aside that are permissible. God is going to broaden your circle and broaden your capacity and your ability to let a diverse group of people in, and we're going to have a good time studying this Word of God tonight. Now, I want you to go to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. I'm going to do quite a bit of reading just so that I don't assume that you understand the story. Most of you that have been in the church a long time have heard this story before, but I'm going to challenge this story, and I'm going to share some things in this story that I believe will make you rethink the relevance and the power of the story itself. In fact, to me, it is not so much the story that is profound as it is the peripheral circumstances and the environment that produce the necessity of Jesus sharing this parabolic message with you. Again, it's in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. I'm going to be reading it out of the NIV, but you follow along in whatever uh, Bible that you have, and I think we'll still get to the same place. The NIV says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Now, this particular part, when it says he's an expert in the law, in the King James Version, it says he's a lawyer. So he's adept. And the question is questionable. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. That's everything. And, now this is where it gets harder, because it's easier to love God than it is to love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked, and who is my neighbor? That's the trick question. Who is my neighbor? Who do you perceive to be your neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him a half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, now you would have thought the priest would have handled this different, he passed by on the other side of the road. So too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Watch closely. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave it them and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about this a little bit. We're talking about broadening your circle. And in order to get the real impact, there's much that has been said about the story. But I think some of the impact is lost uh, in the story because we don't have the backstory that preceded it. It's important that you understand when you deal with this that this expert in the law is not really a Christ seeker. 
He has come to interrogate Christ to the intent that he might trip him up in his theology and embarrass him publicly for his ineptitude to be able to articulate and rightly divide the word of God. And you must understand, every question you get doesn't come from a good place. Every person that comes along to challenge you doesn't come because they're seeking information and truth. The Bible said to avoid foolish and unlearned questions because they do gender strife. And sometimes you'll find yourself wrestling with somebody and it's not even worth the fight because they really are not seekers of truth. This is why discernment is very, very important. But what happened in the process of the conversation is Jesus began to trip him up with his own knowledge. What did the word say? Well, that you should love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And, and that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it doesn't seem to me that he minds loving God. And people don't mind loving God because God is so lovable. God loved us. He first loved us. He's good to us. He's merciful. He's kind. It's easy to love God. But when he said, love your neighbor like you love yourself, oh my, that's when it's got thick in there because he turns around. He does not give a rebuttal to loving God. He gives a rebuttal to loving his neighbor. And that's where the devil is <laughs> when it comes to loving people. Because people are not good like God. They're not merciful like God. They're not kind like God. And loving people is where our faith is tested and where our flesh is crucified and where we have to hold our tongue sometimes and, and where we have to not defend ourselves and be defenseless even when we know we're right. And that's not easy to do. So this man wants to, to hold down this vulnerability to people that he has selected. Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus begins to give the story. The story, we call it the Good Samaritan. But the truth of the matter is to call this text the Good Samaritan is an oxymoron. Because in the days of Jesus Christ, Amongst traditional Orthodox Jews, Samaritans were not good. And to call him a good Samaritan is like talking about hot ice. The two terms don't go together, good and Samaritan, in the way that they viewed the Samaritans. So this is getting down, Jesus is cutting down into how they view people. Uh, how you view people is how you have been conditioned to view people. And that conditioning comes from television, it comes from social media, it comes from the news, it comes from your parents, it comes from the school you came up in. A lot of contributing factors come into play when it comes into how do you view the world and how do you view people in the world and how do you interact with those people and do you truly love them like you love yourself? Do you forgive them like you forgive yourself? Do you help them like you would help yourself? Do you have compassion on them like you would yourself? Well, how you respond to that has a lot to do with how you were raised and who you were raised around and who beat you up when you were a little kid and, and what you were taught about different uh, sociological constructs. Now, that's a term I want to dig down into. When you start talking about sociological constructs, a sociological construct is an idea that has been created and accepted by people in a society. A sociological construct is an idea that has been created and accepted by the people in a society. It's not a God idea. It's not a foregone conclusion. People are the creators and the acceptor of that truth. For example, class distinctions are a sociological construct. For example, race ideas are a sociological construct. For example, how you value money is a sociological construct. If you take two babies, three babies, an Asian baby, a black baby, and a white baby, and you put them in a crib and let them start playing together, they don't have any problems playing together because they have not yet been conditioned and they have not constructed a sociological idea about that. If you take a rich baby and a poor baby, and put them in a sandbox. The rich baby won't turn up his nose at the poor baby. The rich baby doesn't even know he's rich. 
I'm saying that most of how we react to people, mates, co-workers, neighbors, are conditioned into us. They're taught human behaviors. And when human behavior is taught by other humans, we create these sociological constructs. Society builds something that it holds to be truth, and they created it, and they accept it, and nobody challenges it. And that's what we call normal. And everybody's idea of normal is based on what kind of construct you built. And what happens that's really frightening to people is when somebody shakes the cage of your construct. Our God is a cage shaker. He will do it through his word. He will do it through your circumstances. He will do it through your environment. But God will not let you enter and leave this world without shaking your cage. And some people will hear it and some people won't. And some people will respond appropriately and some people don't. And I don't know which kind you are because just because you're a church person doesn't mean that you're not in a cage. I have met millions, <coughs> literally millions of church people who have cages, doctrinal cages, theological cages. Uh, you believe a certain way and you don't interact with anybody who doesn't believe what you believe and you broke up with your friend and now you're not friends anymore because they joined a church that you don't agree with. That's a sociological construct. You have an idea and a philosophy of who are good, who's good and who's not good and so when certain people walk past your car, you lock the car door. That's a sociological construct. You have an attitude of superiority because of how you look or how you dress, or what you have on. And you would never stop by or say hello or speak to that other girl because look at how she's dressed and she hasn't had her hair done. And you make fun of her nails and you make fun of her clothes. And you say, I wish she had a friend or I wish she had a mirror. And you talk down at her because you think that you're better than her when that's a sociological construct. There is no difference between the homeless person and the person who walks past them. There could have been a time in the life of the homeless person that he would have been driving the car. And if you're not careful, you could have been the person on the side of the road. All these ideas of sociological barriers create walls between us. We don't have to build them. They're already constructed by our history and our background. So these are not walls made with brick and mortar. They're not erected to control the border. We already have borders. We have all kinds of borders. Borders around our mind, borders around our heart, borders around our personal life, borders around our finances. We're filled with borders. And I'm using that term metaphorically to tell you that society builds walls whether we expend tax dollars or not. You can feel it in the grocery store. You can feel it in the mall. You can feel it in the way certain types of people look and handle you. And it can be over anything. The color of your skin, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes. Many, many tests have been done that even when race is taken out of the factor, people find other things to, to hate about other people. Blue-eyed people stop liking brown-eyed people. We find some basis to be arrogant and to be superior. That's what Jesus is messing with. So he tells him this story. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves. And the thieves in turn stripped him and wounded him and left him half dead. At this point, Jesus has a man laying on the side of the road, his face down into the sandy dirt of the dark of the Palestinian heat in a tumultuous situation and it is about to get dark and thereby cold and freezing. And there he is in the darkness of the night, alienated, in pain, bleeding, left alone, perhaps delusionary, out of his head, wondering if he's going to die, half dead, pulse getting weak, heart slowing down, temperatures falling. He thinks he is about to die in this peril, in this turmoil, in this crisis. There is a certain feeling that comes when you hear footsteps coming. Maybe I might get to live. Maybe I might survive this. Maybe somebody will pass by and have compassion on me. I want you to understand how important the footsteps are. Because when you're dying and you're going to die alone and you don't hear any footsteps, you lose something more important than blood. You lose hope. And when you lose hope, 
you have lost everything. Hope deferred, the Bible said, makes the heart sick. So when you lose hope, you have lost just about everything. This man was dying physically, dying emotionally, losing hope, and then he heard footsteps. Oh, bless God, it's a man of God coming. It's somebody from my circle. It's somebody I believe in. It's somebody I respect. It's a priest coming. The priest came by and looked over at him and turned and walked away. Now, I'm not judging the priest. Maybe he was afraid the thieves were still close by. Maybe he didn't feel that he was confident or strong enough to lift the man. But for whatever reason, the priest passed by. Shortly thereafter, a Levite comes along. And surely this is a Levite. Surely he's going to come and he's going to do something. He is instructed in the way of the Lord. He's part of the Aaronic priesthood. He's raised up in an environment that is conducive and supportive of the ordinances and the oracles of God. I know he's going to do the God thing. To, you know, what would Jesus do? He, he's going to come over there and he's going to rescue. He did not do that. He looked at him, said, mm, sure looks bad. Turned around and walked away. Left the man worse off than he was before, still losing blood, still losing hope, still losing strength. And finally, a Samaritan passes by. Why does Jesus tell us that the third guy was a Samaritan? That's what I want to talk about today. Jesus goes out of his way. He could have said another stranger passed by. He could have said uh, a, a Jewish peasant passed by. He could have said a tax collector passed by. But when he said a Samaritan passed by, he is now challenging this man's sociological construct. Because if there were anything that the Jews of Jesus' time did not like, it was the Samaritans. When Jesus commissioned the 70 to go out and to start ministering the gospel, he told them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, but do not go to the Samaritans and do not go to the Gentiles. Even Jesus told them not to go because salvation had to first be offered to his own brethren, his covenant, his circle. Later, that will be broken. Later, that will be enlarged. Later, that will grow. You remember when the Bible said in the Gospel of St. John that Jesus told his disciples, I think it's chapter 4, that he must need go through Samaria? Jesus decided to go through Samaria? God had a plan for Samaria. The Jews hated the Samaritans. How do you know that? A lot of ways I know that. But let's start with one. When the woman at the well came down to the well, she said, what are you doing down here at the well, you being a Jew? You know that we, our people have no dealings with each other, saying that I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew. We don't even deal with each other. We don't communicate with each other. We don't talk with each other. What are you doing hanging out in my neighborhood? Jesus went into other zip codes. We tend to stay in the zip codes of our comfort. And whenever you stay in the zip code of your comfort, you're staying in the sociological construct that makes you comfortable. And a lot of times that has a lot to do with affecting your life, your blessings, your prosperity, your healing, your restoration, because God did not promise to send the blessing through people you like. God did not promise to send the blessing through people you're used to. God did not promise to send the blessing to people you approve of. In fact, many times, God will send your blessing into the hands of somebody that you would prefer not to interact with. You remember when Hagar was out in the wilderness and about to die, and the Lord sent her back to Sarai to go back home because I have chosen Sarai to bless you. She and Sarai didn't get along, but God chose somebody that she did not even like to bless her and then humble her and made her go back and submit herself in a place where Hagar did not want to be, but God controls who he decides to use to bless you. Let me show you again in scripture. The Bible said, I will make your enemies your footstool. That means the very people that you don't like, I'll make them the footstool that carries you to the next letter. That sounds good when you're preaching a sermon, but when you work that thing out in real life, do you have the courage to step on the step? 
if the step is somebody you don't like? Or would you choose to stay in your circle and wither and die rather than to receive the help from somebody that challenges your construct, what you have built in your mind? There is not a person listening at me right now who doesn't have some kind of construct that you've built in your mind and preconceived ideologies about certain types of people or certain types of clothing or certain types of income or certain kinds of politics or certain kinds of theology there or, or certain kind of gender. Everybody that I am talking to right now has some sort of circle that you feel safe in and God is about to broaden your circle. He's about to shatter it. He's about to break it into pieces because God is going to use some unorthodox ways to bless you, some unorthodox ways to get you out of the situation that you're in, and it's going to challenge the way you think. I feel the presence of the Lord talking to you right now. It's going to challenge the way you think. It's going to challenge the truth as you know it. It's going to challenge your construct. It's going to challenge your philosophies. It's going to challenge your ideas. It's going to challenge how you proceed in the future. Now let's go deeper. Can we go deeper into this? I want to go deeper because I wanted to understand why do the Jews hate the Samaritans? If you just read the New Testament, all you know is the results, but you don't know the cause. You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it started. So we got to go back a ways and dig down into this to really see what's going on. And I won't take the time to read the scripture because there's a lot of scripture to read, but you need to read 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. When you read 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1 through 7, you will understand that Jesus is now dealing with the after effects of something that happened before he was even born. This, this, this construct that has become cemented into the mind of this lawyer did not start with him. Let's not blame him. It started ancestrally. From generation to generation, certain things passed down and biases passed down to us without us ever even being aware that they passed down. And they do not just pass down to white people. They pass down to black people. They pass down to brown people. They pass down to rich people. They pass down to poor people. They pass down to Baptist people. They pass down to Jehovah Witness. They pass down to Seventh-day Adventists. There are certain things that pass down generationally that you step into a construct that you didn't construct, but your society and your ancestry participated. You got to read, you got to read 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1 through 17, because it, it'll really blow your mind. In it, it talks about Rehoboam, who was the king of the united monarchy of Israel. And he continued until about, about 932 BC. Now, when you start looking into Rehoboam, he was the grandchild of David and the son of Solomon. So you get some kind of sense of who he is. If you understand who David is and you understand that Solomon is the love child of David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba, and yet he is also the successor to the king. He becomes the king of Israel by, through the illicit sins of his father. Uh, it's how he was born, and now he becomes the king of uh, 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 of Israel. Now, he is not the love child born through their affair because that child died, but subsequently he marries Bathsheba, and the first child that is produced out of that marriage is called Solomon, but the marriage would not have occurred if the adultery hadn't occurred. So you can see what I'm saying. It's kind of it's kind of shaky waters, but the, this is Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And Solomon is also known for building the temple the opulent, beautiful, amazing temple that we often talk about as church people today. We either teach on the temple or we teach around the temple. You know, if my people who are called by my name, all of that beautiful text shall humble themselves and pray is God's response to Solomon after he built the temple. And Solomon says, what happens if you shut up the heavens? What happens if there be no more rain? What happens if this wonderful moment of dedication where we just dedicated this amazing temple, if something challenges it, God says, 
If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. All of that is in result to Solomon building the temple. And we shout about it. We sing about it. And we talk about how the, the spirit fell on the temple and the priest lay prostrate in the floor and nobody could minister because there was such a great anointing of what Solomon had built. We talk about all of that. What we don't talk about is that everybody wasn't so happy that Solomon built the temple. Because when Solomon built the temple and became king and led an opulent lifestyle, the taxes on the regular people went higher and higher and higher, and they resented it. Not only that, all the other synagogues begin to go down in attendance because Solomon is going up and everybody's not happy about it. And there is a disgruntled uh, attitude that's breaking out in Israel. Israel, let's go into Israel, was broken down into 12 tribes, okay? We have just seen King David u unite the, the, the brokenness that, lift, that lived in his era by connecting them back together. He first becomes the king of Judah, then he becomes the king of Israel. He unites them. But it's almost like sewing a piece on a dress when you repair something, it's never as strong as it was originally. And so their union isn't quite as tight as it was under David's leadership. Up under Solomon's leadership, it becomes more strained as Solomon puts more stress on them with taxes. They begin to break apart. When they break apart, they break apart in this fashion. They break apart where the 10 kingdoms, the 10 tribes, all uh, uh, gathered together in the northern part of Israel. Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, gathered in the southern part of Israel. And they began to break apart. They were all initially a part of the united monarchy of Israel. But around 932 BC, things started getting shaky. And all of a sudden, you begin to see problems break out. The northern kingdoms were frustrated. They were frustrated with the taxation. They were frustrated with Solomon's temple. They were frustrated in not being able to do their own thing. And little by little, they began to introduce little bits of idolatry that began to shape how they saw God. And they also began to resent the leadership of Rehoboam. And when they resented it to such a degree that, that they wanted to break away from him and find their own leader, which, which really caused Jeroboam to come into power. Now, let's, let's go deeper into this, because this is, this is about to get good. After the split, Rehoboam continued to reign over the southern kingdoms. That's a big fall, because there's only two kingdoms in the south. So he went from 12 to 2. What happened to the 10? I'm glad you asked. This dude named Jeroboam, who had been exiled into Egypt, when he heard that Rehoboam was going to tax the people severely, he comes out of hiding and starts to lead a revolution. Now, let's I want to go deeper into this. Bear with me. I know this is kind of heavy, but bear with me, because I think this is going to speak to your soul in, in a mighty way. <laughs> When Rehoboam becomes king over the mon united monarch of Israel and they begin to complain to him about taxes, he asks his elders what should he do. They said, maybe you should lower the taxation of the people a little bit, calm this thing down and hold us together. He went then to his peers, his younger peers, and asked for their advice. And young people are always more volatile than old people because you're young and you're biologically, you got testosterone and you, you, you view the world the way you want it to be and, and they're more radical. And sometimes that works out good because every great revolution that changed the world came from young people. Sometimes it works out bad because they don't have the calmness of older people to think things through. In this case, it worked out badly. Jerrell Boehm listened at the voices of his younger comrades, and when the 10 tribes came to ask him, he said, give me three days. He talked to both sides. He decided to go with what the young people said. He said, my father beat you with whip lashes. I will beat you with scorpions. In other words, I'm going to drive the taxes up even higher than they were. 
when he did that, Rehoboam comes up out of Egypt, takes advantage of disgruntled people. Now, you have to be careful, leaders, about disgruntled people. You have to be careful of disgruntled employees. You have to be careful of people who feel alienated. Because generally, if there's going to be an attack, it's going to come when those who are against you unite their forces to try to overthrow you. And that's exactly what happened here. When it's all said and done, Rehoboam ends up with only two tribes, started out with 12, okay? And out, out of that, Jeroboam comes along and he takes the 10 tribes of Israel and continues to lead them. Why did you take us through all of that? Because all of that has something to do with all of this. The 10 tribes in the north that Rehoboam began to lead waxed worse and worse. They were in the high places. Everybody else is worshiping in Solomon's temple. They started building idol, idolatrous gods up in the mountaintops, and they started to build those idolatrous gods and separated from the other tribes and went on their own. They also started marrying the Assyrians and started intermarrying outside of the culture. And oddly enough, the very thing that they didn't like about Solomon is the very thing that they went back and did. They started marrying other women. And so they became a mixed breed of people that later in the New Testament would be called dogs and heathens. And in addition to that, they became idolatrous. They dropped most of the Bible, keeping the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. They did not accept the major prophets and minor prophets, the books of poetry, and the other 39 uh, books of the Bible. They resisted that and only took five, so they threw away 34 books, kept five books, and developed this hybrid religion and started worshiping in the mountains. Fast forward to something you're familiar with. Jesus must need go through Samaria. This is hundreds of years later. He comes down to the well. The woman says, the Jews and the Samaritans have no dealings. Later, she says, my people worship in the mountain. Jesus said, your people worship in the mountain, ye know not what. You finally get to understand why he's saying that. The reason he's saying that is because she is a descendant of the 10 tribes that went in their own way, developed their own religion that was similar <coughs> to Orthodox Judaism, but not quite the same. And Jesus calls her out on it and says, y'all don't even know what you're doing worshiping up in the mountain. You've got this mixed religion, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Watch out for people that take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and mix it all together and come up with their own theology. Jesus said, we know who we worship because salvation is of the Jews. But the hour coming to now is that they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. I want you to see the climate here, how Jesus has the strength to disagree, but the compassion to continue the conversation. Do you have the compassion to continue to conversate with people that you have a stereotypical attitude about and with people that you disagree? If you don't, you're gonna be lost in this season of famine because many times God is going to use somebody in the famine to bless you that is not of you. Oh God, help me right now. If you stay in that circle you're in, and never deviate outside of that circle, you're going to miss the blessing that God has for you because God often uses people that are unlike you to open up the windows of heaven to bless you. He fed Elijah through the mouth of the ravens. He fed the prophet Elijah at the, at the widow of Seraphat's house who says, as thy God liveth. It wasn't even her God, but God used that woman to sustain him. Who is God going to use to sustain you? Whoever I'm talking to today, this is a preparatory Bible class getting you ready for God to use somebody that you didn't expect. It's not coming from your uncle. It's not coming from your relatives. It's not coming from your rich friend. It's not coming from your cousin that's got a good job. God will raise up somebody that you that is least likely and do the almighty through them to bless you if you're not afraid to allow the Samaritan to become good.
Oh, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Because I want to get down into something. Many times in my own life, God has used people that were way out of my theological sphere to bless me. They opened up doors. They gave me opportunities. They let me use their platform. I can't, remember, I can't forget the first time that I sat down with Larry King and started having a discussion. And Larry King was an admitted uh, agnostic. I think now he considers himself an atheist. And there we were having a conversation, an agnostic and a Pentecostal preacher having a conversation on primetime television. Did I get up and walk away from the conversation because we disagreed about the existence of God? Absolutely not. Because Larry King let me use his platform to share my message. The opportunities that are coming in your life, don't be afraid of them because you don't agree with who gave you the opportunity. As my mother would say, eat the fish and throw away the bones, but receive the opportunity that God has for you. I'm talking to your mind right now because some of you are so conditioned to live within your construct that you alienate yourself from the answer that God is sending in your life to bless you. God is sending something to bless you. Oh, bless his name. God is sending someone to bless you. God is sending someone to bless you. And they may not dress right, and they may not look right, and they may not look like you, and they may not have your background, and they may not share your values, but God is sending someone to bless you. Can you imagine the man on the Jericho Road, bleeding to death, half dead, and looks up and sees that it's a Samaritan and says, don't touch me. You're a Samaritan. He would have died because of his biases. He would have utterly been destroyed because of his biases. It's important that we teach this message now because our world, our country, our churches, and even our families are more divided than they've ever been before. Your family has turned into gangs. Oh, yeah, I'm talking to you. Your family's got gangs. <clears throat> I'm not talking about the Crips and the Bloods, but you got Crips and the Bloods in your family. You got gangs in your family that take sides and fight the other side and everybody is fighting. Mothers against daughters, last days. Fathers against sons. People who normally would be together, you're finding it difficult to come together. Some of you dread Thanksgiving dinner. You dread the holiday because your mother-in-law's coming over and that other tribe is coming over and your son and his girlfriend are coming over and she doesn't like you and all of you got tribes to continue. All these tribes going on in your life. So many tribes. Democrats and Republicans used to be able to disagree and still have lunch together. Now, if you disagree with me, you're not an American. You're an animal. You're a dog. You're terrible. You're awful. Th those days are gone of being able to step, being mature enough to step over your differences and understanding that there's more to unite us than there is to divide us. That doesn't mean that we can't have speak truth to power. That doesn't mean that we can't have honest conversations. That doesn't mean that we can't describe our perspective. But you can't change people you won't talk to. You can't help people that you won't talk to. And more importantly, they can't help you. God will use somebody that you don't like to bless you. And the power of this text that we're studying in Luke 10 is that Jesus is trying to shatter the construct that exists around the minds of these people to think that the only people that can bless you are the people who are like you. The truth of the matter is the people who were most like the man who went down from Jerusalem, Jerusalem now, Jerusalem, which incidentally is the place uh, that the southern tribes inherited. They inherited Jerusalem. They inherited Solomon's temple. This man went down from Jerusalem and fell amongst thieves, stripped him, wounded him, left him half dead. Everybody that he thought would help him did not. I want to talk to some people out there who are living with the disappointment that the people you thought were going to be by your side were not. The people you thought would come to rescue you did not. The people you thought would call you on the phone and ask you, are you all right, did not. You're sitting up right now in an isolated situation, in a quarantine situation, and some of the very people you thought would call you and check on you didn't call. And some of the most unlikely people came to your rescue and came to your aid because God is trying to shatter how you see the world and tear down your construct and open your understanding to the fact that the Samaritan might be the one that brings you the oil and the wine.
that pours in the healing balm in your womb, that wraps up the bleeding and stops the hemorrhaging in your life, that gives you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or introduces you to your next job or your next opportunity. You have to understand that. Or they may even be so compassionate that they get down off their beasts and walk so that you can ride on their beasts all the way to the end. That's love. And you don't get to pick who God chooses to love you through. I'm going to say that again. You don't get to pick who God chooses to love you through. The reality is God is loving the man who's bleeding and half dead. God is healing the man who's bleeding and half dead. God has made provisions for the man who's bleeding and half dead. And God has made provisions for you. I want to talk to somebody who's losing money, losing strength, losing love, losing relationships, and you're sitting up there wondering what in the world is going to happen. God is going to do it. God is going to heal you. God is going to bless you. God is going to raise your finances. God is going to pull you through. God is going to open up your eyes. God is going to create an opportunity. God is going to give you a position. God's going to give you a promotion. God's going to give you a place to stay. But you may not recognize him because he may come dressed as your Samaritan. Who are the Samaritans in your life? Who are the people in your life that you you won't ask a question when you're in the mall and you need directions because they're not kin enough to you? Who are the people in your life that you drive past to find somebody else to talk to? I'm not talking about open bigotry where you're running around in sheets and stuff like that. I'm not talking about open bigotry where you're hating white people or rich people or poor people. But we have biases in and out of every race and culture. And even within the race and culture, poor people don't like rich people. Some rich people don't like poor people. And we pick who we're going to come up to. Because if they're wearing sagging pants, I'm not going up to them. Or if they just got out of a Rolls Royce, I feel uncomfortable talking to them. I want to take you outside of your comfort zone because God is getting ready to bless you and it's not going to come through anybody that you have in your cell phone. The promises of God that are in your Bible did not promise to line up with the folks in your Rolodex that are in your phone. It may not be anybody that you talk to frequently, but I swear God is going to bless you. The substratum of this text, the power of this conversation, the importance of this story centers around the question that the lawyer asked the lawgiver, who is my neighbor? Did you hear that? The lawyer asked the lawgiver, who is my neighbor? And Jesus shatters his understanding. See, the problem with words We can say the same words, but they don't mean the same thing. We all have our interpretation of a word. When one person says, I love you, and another person says, I love you too, they use the same word, but it doesn't always mean the same thing. Some people throw the word love around like they're french fries at McDonald's. Other people are very careful with how they use the word love. Some people throw the word friend around. I'm kind of funny about that word friend. I don't like to use that too quick because to me, Friend means something that I have come to learn that a lot of other people do not define friendship the way that I do. And all of a sudden, what they're fighting over in the whole story is what does it mean to be my neighbor? And Jesus utterly blows their mind, not just of the lawyer, but he shatters through generations of constructs and preconceived ideologies that has brought this lawyer to the point that in his mind, he's trying to make sure that he doesn't have to love who he doesn't like. Woo, that's good right there. How do I get to unlove who I don't like? And Jesus sits down and tells him a story. And that's what I want to do is sit down and tell you a story. That if you're on the side of the road and maybe COVID-19 has stripped you and wounded you and left you half dead. And you're hemorrhaging in your emotions or your finances or your time or your job or your mortgage. And you're wondering, am I going to make it or not? Or maybe you've gone through some other kind of crisis that has left you less than you were before you started your journey. Because anytime you start a journey, you're not promised to arrive the way you left. 
And if you're stuck someplace and you've seen a deduction, even in your ability to love or your ability to live or your ability to give or your ability to think, and you're, you're laying there bleeding, and you can be going to work and still be bleeding. You can be driving a car and still be bleeding. You can be going on a date and still be bleeding because a lot of people don't see the hemorrhaging, but you yourself know that you're bleeding up under that dress, bleeding up under that coat, bleeding up under that suit, and you've gone through some things from which you have not recovered that stripped you, that wounded you, that left you half dead, and you've been praying in your secret life, God, send me some help. But if the help rang the doorbell and it didn't look like what you expected it to look like, would you open the door? If the help called you on the phone and it didn't sound like somebody that was familiar, would you open the door? That's what this text is all about. This text really centers around the great challenge to broaden your circle. If you went through Mother's Day and nobody and, and your own kids didn't call you and somebody else did, can you open up your circle, quit crying about who didn't call you and thank God for who God sent? Because sometimes it is not promised to come from your daughter. It's not promised to come from your son. It's not promised to always come from your mother. Everybody who got mothered didn't get mothered by their mother. Everybody who got fathered didn't get fathered by their father. God will use somebody that has no DNA like yours, and yet they have fathered you. And you're so busy crying over who turned and walked away that you don't praise God for who came over and poured in the oil and wine. I want to shatter the way you think about your life right now. What does it matter if it didn't come from the Levite and the priest as long as it came? What does it matter if it didn't come from your child as long as it came? What does it matter if it didn't come from your father as long as it came? God wants to restore to you the years that the canker worms and the palmer worm and the locusts ate up. But some people refuse to be restored because they're so wounded by who left that they can't rejoice about who came. I want to talk to you today. Are you listening at me? This Bible class is not just designed to teach you the historicity of the Samaritans. It is not just designed to lay a foundation up under a very familiar text. It is not just designed to titillate your intellectualism with years and concepts and ideas about cultures and, and the procession of the ups and downs of the people of Israel. No. What good is it to understand the historicity if you can't contemporize the text and make it applicable to who I am right now? Wherever you are in the world listening at me right now, there's not a person in this world that hadn't been stripped, wounded, and left half dead by something. A lover who left, a marriage that failed, a child that doesn't like you, a parent that doesn't regard you. We all live with our wounds. We don't get to pick who wounds us and we don't get to pick who heals us because sometimes God will send the greatest healing through the person you would least accept it from. That's what this text is all about. This text is a challenge to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Only when you allow your neighbor to be bigger than the people that you have in your phone. This text is about living with expectation even when you've had disappointment. This text is about surviving who walked away so that you will be alive for who is about to come. Because if you are not careful, you will be so grief stricken over the turn of events. Look at the turn of events. I was just walking. I wasn't bothering anybody. I was trying to get from point A to point B. I ran into thieves. I didn't ask for these thieves. I don't want these thieves. They stripped me. Now I'm naked. I'm naked outside, alone. I've been on a Jericho Road. It is a winding road with sand blowing all in your nose and in your mouth and everywhere. It's the worst place in the world to be naked, it is cold at night, it is hot during the day. This man, they stripped him and they wounded him. I could have walked on naked, I'd have been embarrassed, but I could have walked on naked, but they wounded him and they left him. 
I want to talk to everybody who's been abandoned by anybody. I want you to see this text in a brand new light. They left him. They stripped him. They wounded him. They left him. You dated somebody. They abused you sexually. They wounded you financially, and they left you half dead. And you've never been the same again. And you're stuck on the Jericho Road right now. For you, this is bigger than just understanding the historicity of the Samaritans. It is a challenge for you to look at your pain in a different perspective. And God is saying, I want to send some help, but because of your sociological constructs, if I would send help, you would turn it away because the help didn't look like what you had in mind. The reason I'm teaching this is that I felt impressed to the Holy Spirit to tell you in the turbulence of this time that we're in right now, you got to broaden your circle. I can't tell you how many people I watch get in trouble, African-American people in particular, who go down to the barbershop and get some lawyer at the barbershop to, to litigate a case, never knowing that the lawyer's a real estate lawyer. And there you are wondering why you lost the case. It's because you stick with the familiar. We get who everybody else got. We do whatever they did. We get somebody, we don't even check them out, but because they're familiar, we take familiarity over competence. Maybe other people do that too, but I know we do that. And I sit up and think, my God, you got a corporate lawyer litigating a criminal case? That guy's not qualified. Yeah, but he was a lawyer and I knew him. And we get our hair cut at the same place. We work out at the same gym. I want him. Those are all dumb reasons to make decisions. The lawyer asked Jesus a question. Who is my neighbor? Because he is only comfortable with who he's comfortable with. And I'm telling you, it is not that God's not going to bless you. And it's not that help is not on the way. But it may not look like what you had in mind. If you can broaden your circle, at least broaden it, maybe you ought to shatter it altogether. Almost every blessing that ever came in my life came through somebody I didn't even know. And some of them came through people I didn't even like. And some of them came through people with which I deeply disagreed with their theology. But God used them to bless me. In this season where we need God's blessing more than we've ever needed it before, we cannot be picky who the mailman is when you desperately need the mail. I want to talk to people who are standing at the mailbox waiting on God to answer and yet running away from the box because you don't like the mailman. God sends this as a 911 message to you right now. Stop! Your Levites will pass by and your priests will look the other way, but I am sending you a Samaritan. And before the experience is over, it will challenge everything your mama and your grandmama ever told you about who to look to for help. Because it is not so much about the Samaritan, it's about the God who sent them. And God will use any body to bless you. As we come to the close of this message, this class, this opportunity to dig into these scriptures, this man poured in the oil and the wine, bandaged up his wounds, traded places with him, set him on his beast, carried him to the inn, spent his money on a stranger who is conditioned not to like him, and then told the innkeeper, if it costs more than I paid, when I return, I will repay you. And when Jesus finished the story, he turned to the lawyer and said, which one of them is a neighbor? And the lawyer had to humble down. The case was closed. The, the closing arguments had come in and Jesus had won the closing argument. And the lawyer said, the one who is merciful is my neighbor. Stop picking people by how they look and start loving people by how they treated you, how they loved you, how they touched you, how they helped you, 
how they ministered to you and broaden your circle. I don't know who this is for. I don't know why God wanted me to teach this class tonight. But for somebody listening at me right now, your survival necessitates that you come out of your little circle. You've exhausted all the ideas in your circle. Everybody in your circle thinks like you. You need somebody who can bring new perspective into your life. Somebody who can ventilate and irrigate your thinking with cross pollinization Our differences are not the, the opiate of our discord. Our differences are designed to enhance our ability to be fruitful. We were meant to cross pollinate. We were meant to integrate and to have relationships and to have ideas and yes, disagreements and discussions and uprisings, but not disconnections, not disconnection. If I disconnect my finger from my hand, my finger will die. If I disconnect my leg from my body, my leg will immediately die. The spirit of disconnections is, is rampant. It's killing our marriages. It's killing our children. It's killing our churches. It's killing our country. It's killing our world. My God, have we not severed every limb we had and wondered why we can't walk? We're looking at a paraplegic country that needs to run like never before, but we are so disconnected that we're not ready to run with patience the race that is set before us. I plead with you today for black folks and white folks and brown folks to come together without one having to be subordinate to the other one. I plead with you for Democrats to sit down with Republicans before another 100,000 people die as you fight for power. I plead with you for rich folks and blessed folks and CEOs in high places to go into rough neighborhoods with compassion and love. It could be that you have the blessing that you have as an opportunity to make a difference in the life of somebody who's been stripped of opportunities that you had, wounded in places you were not, left half dead in the dark, and you say, this is America, they ought to be able to get up. If you were stripped and wounded and half dead, you couldn't get up either. The reason you got your beast is to give them a ride. The reason you're carrying the oil and the wine is to pour it into somebody else. The reason you thought to put the bandages in the bag was to be there and you were called for such a time as this. And woe be unto you if you don't give your oil and wine and throw your bandages around somebody other than you and other than yours and other than your kids and other than people who look like you. What good? is knowing the word or even hearing the word if we're not going to do the word. Out of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, I submit for your consideration. Broaden your circle. Can I pray with you right now? I want to pray with all of you that just cannot seem to get over who left. I am so exhausted of year after year after year of you crying about who didn't come through and missing who did. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bow my head to pray. I know what it is to bleed. I know what it is to be stripped. I know what it is to be wounded and hurt. I know what it is to be existing and not living and, and, and half dead and nobody know it. I pray for those people under the sound of my voice whose thoughts are consumed with the disappointment 
of all those people that they thought would come and they didn't. But I pray, God, you would give them the listening ear of faith to hear who you did send, to open up to what they do have, to experience the power of God in a fresh and powerful way. Break preachers out of their traditions. Break us away from our isolation. Dear God, we were isolated before COVID-19. We were quarantined before the coronavirus ever hit. Speak to the invisible walls that we built around our hearts, around our heads, around our romantic lives, our personal lives, our church lives. I don't go to that church because of this. I don't go to that church. I don't go to that. God, tear down those barriers so that we can get what you need, even if it comes from a Samaritan. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if that word blessed you in any way, if it touched you in any way, if it spoke to you in any way, if it healed you in any way, if it helped you in any way, let me hear from you. If you know somebody who should have heard this Bible class, send them to the, our YouTube station as fast as you can. Repost it, mail it, send it on a pigeon. I don't care how you get it to them, but get this word out because I am completely convinced that as long as we isolate our circle and introvert our perspectives, and counsel ourselves and medicate ourselves with whatever you're self-medicating with, you will never get away from your Jericho Road. I want you to open your heart to the Samaritans. God bless you. Men and women, single and married, black, white, brown, you've got that sense of having your hands full. Stress increases when you got your hands full. All of a sudden you find yourself in a situation when you start to wonder, am I enough? This might be disruption, but it is not destruction. Forget success. Ain't nobody worried about no success up in here. Survival is success. Don't you see what happened to the Joneses next door? What do you do when the demand seems greater than the supply? What do you do when you're at your wit's end and you say, Lord, if one more thing happens, I don't have time to be bitter because God doesn't need what I lost. God will always use what you got left.